listening to the Project Ignite podcast, where real digital entrepreneurs reveal their very best tips, tools, and strategies to help you ignite and grow your online business. ProjectIgnite.com. Your digital business starts here. Now, here's your host, Derek Gale. Welcome to another episode of the Project Ignite podcast, a podcast designed to skip the hype, skip all the BS, and bring you real actionable tips and strategies to help you grow your business and income on the internet. This is your host, Derek Gale. And today we're going to be diving deep into uh, actually a topic that fascinates the hell out of me uh, and something I've been kind of studying more and more uh, over the past really six months and, and using in different ways. And that is artificial intelligence. Now I've been using it in content creation and testing out different copywriting and strategies, but today we're going to talk about it in terms of how to use it to improve your search engine rankings in good old Google. And uh, today's guest is the mastermind behind uh, the award winning, award winning, I should say, technology that helps deliver over 1 million organic visitors per month to Fortune 100 companies and freelance content creators alike. He's the CTO and creator of the Inc. Editor, a new AI content performance optimization platform that won Product Hunt's coveted product of the day and month at launch and is, has grown to over 10,000 users in less than six months. And so today we're going to dive into how AI is affecting SEO, uh, his journey of, of building and creating this and how it's helping marketers create content um, that audiences want to engage with and that Google also so likes. And I've been looking forward to this conversation because like I said, AI, I mean, it, it is, whether you know it or not, it is here and it's already making changes to the internet. I mean, there's a good chance you've read some content recently that is created not by a human, but by a <laughs> artificial intelligence. And it's going to revolutionize, I think, so much of how we do business online. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome today's guest, Alexander DeRitter, to the show. Alexander, thank you so much for being here. Nice to have, nice to be here with you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, how did you just give me your, your sort of your background? How did you get into AI and SEO? Like how did that come together? What brought you to that? Uh, yeah, so um, I studied computer science back in Europe and Belgium, mm -hmm. and um, then my first job out of university was um, was at a marketing company. Mm -hmm. I picked up a book on Ajax, um, mm -hmm. and I thought, hey, this is cool. Marketing companies should like use that stuff in their campaigns, mm -hmm. and um, got a job where I got to do some really interesting things and. In, the early 2000s, kind of uh, coming up with like a tracking pixel and so forth um, for email, uh, see what email lists were effective. I mm -hmm. mean, it was really the Wild West. Oh, yes, before. it was. Yeah, I mean, it was great. Um, we did some amazing campaigns there, but um, I had this, uh, I had the joke that uh, I'm like, generally like believing in the good of people and like an optimist and so forth for mankind and humankind. And then uh, the other 50% of the time, <laughs> I'm a marketer. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, and, and, we've all heard the term marketers wreck everything, right? I mean, right. Uh, it's, it's sad, so but true. What fascinated me was uh, how and why we make the decisions we do. Mm -hmm. And especially like online. Uh, why is it that if you change the button on a on a buy now but uh, on a buy now, why, if you change the color on it, why is it that your conversion rate goes up or down? Mm -hmm. Like, are we that simple minded that we click because it's a certain color uh, or uh, or exactly the type of wording or approach you use? It, it, it's just fascinating, mm -hmm. and it, it was you know I I kind of started out just uh, on this journey just because I wanted to understand myself better. Mm -hmm. um, didn't know the why and how I make my own decisions mm -hmm. and uh, combine that with just a very fascinating field of computer science and how technology enables marketing. And you kind of have a winning combination there. Um, my, uh, my, my, my first entry into machine learning uh, started in 2008 when um, I had the opportunity to um, work on um, computer vision, uh, like um, gender recognition, um, 
age estimation mm -hmm. for digital displays with cameras. Um, like you would walk in a mall and why would I pitch um, like, um, like Gillette or something to a child, right? So sure. um, waste of screen space. So I thought, hey, we can optimize um, the real world like we optimize digital advertising online, personalization. And um, then around 2012, I saw um, a shift happening in the, in the industry where uh, previously, and like many people are like ML, AI, what, you know, this is, this gets philosophical. The way I understand it and explain it is that with like machine learning, I had to like to detect the face. I had to say, look for two things that look at, like an eye look for a nose. And if the nose is somewhere between the two eyes, you're likely to have a face, right? You mm -hmm. had to, you had to like um, extract features if, if you will uh, with, uh, a with AI and like neural networks and deep learning that changed, right? So now you just give it a bunch of faces, pictures of faces and say, these are faces. Mm -hmm. Now learn on your own how to recognize, uh, find a face out of a picture you've never seen. So um, those neural nets develop and make connections where you wouldn't even expect there to be connections. Um, that's why um, like when neural networks were used to play StarCraft or like these computer games, mm -hmm. You see, you, you see the computer doing things like programmers have never tried before. And he was like, what is that? And somehow it worked. Um, anyway, so when Facebook started coming out with, with a paper and say, hey, we can now find all the cats in the pictures that you've ever uploaded. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is going to change search. This the totally. game on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's kind of the, the origin story of how all this started. And the... Um, the big idea was developed between 2013 and 2015 um, in, um, in, in, in asked the question, like, how is Google going to use neural networks to quantify, you know, to quantify the quality of content itself as mm -hmm. it relates to matching, up, lining up with searchers intent, what they really are looking for. Mm -hmm. Because a, as you may remember, the game of SEO used to be a game of links, right? Yeah. Um, and um, it's like your Jenga tower, how much you can stack them up. Yeah, totally. Um, but the, the, it, the writing was on the wall that it was going to be, become more quality driven. And I, I really believed um, that and still do. And since then, I think it's become more a common knowledge that, um, that the quality of your content and how complete it is, um, it really influences how the Google crawlers uh, you know, are going to then judge your content and mm -hmm. uh, subsequently index it. So, I, and I totally agree. I mean, I've seen the shift in the SEO work that we've done. I mean, if we go back, actually not even that long ago, you know, five, 500, 800 word posts with enough backlinks would, would rank, right? Wasn't necessary about quality. Now we're getting to these pieces, you know, major cornerstone, heavy, heavy pieces of content. Um, but Here's the question I have in terms of being able to compare two pieces of content and determine quality purely based on what's on page. Even because here's the thing as an SEO person um, and, and as a search engine, we can all control what's on page, right? So we can always control the level of content. And as that bar gets a little higher and a little higher, we continue to sharpen our knives and, you know, make things better and, and continue to improve the content. And all of a sudden, you know, the level goes up and the level goes up and the level goes up. But it's at some point, the content is as complete and as good as it's going to get, right? So at what point does, I, I, I like, even today, links still seem to be the heaviest influence. And I don't know if I see content ever being able to out influence links. I mean, what do you think? Yeah. So, um, the, the name of the game is authority. Yeah. Expertise and trust and links are only a part of the story of authority. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and as far as the first assess uh, assertion you made around the, the quality of content can only get that high. 
I would say that um, the sites who then also update their content, keep it accurate, keep it up to date and keep adding more content are going to be the one that are going to be seen by Google as an authority. Mm -hmm. And those sites are going to then outrank the sites with lower authority because they are outdated, for example. Sure. So um, it is, it is. And you, and in addition to that, you'd be surprised. Sometimes the worst offenders are the biggest brands uh, Mm -hmm. with the worst experiences. And um, you can, as a, as a smaller business, you can really make some damage if you focus on a, a very specific niche and yeah. really, really own it, you can really go after and compete with these uh, large brands. You'd be surprised how, um, how how democratized the internet marketing is from that point of view. No, I, and I totally agree. And I, I mean, I see it every day. I see it in the work we do as well. I see us ranking, you know, on keywords against much bigger authorities, but it's because I think we've done a better job on the content and combine that with links for sure. Now, how do you see... Uh, so I want to get into how you're using AI in terms of, you know, a competitive advantage from the SEO side of it. But how do you think right now AI is influencing the um, Google's algorithm? And, you know, how is it changing what they're looking at? Like, you know, I'm obviously for better content and better authority, but at what level do you think, uh, and I've speculated on this, do you think it has the ability to scan a page and not just look at the text, but also take into account the images that exist, text that might exist in those images, videos, stuff like that. Are they looking at that depth yet? Yeah, actually they do. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe that depth that you're describing hasn't fully rolled out yet. Mm -hmm. But um, about a month ago, Google announced um, uh, Google MUM, M-U-M, Multitask United Model, something like that. Another Um, abbreviation we need. (laughs) Right. And um, essentially, you could think of it like a model that's about 10 times larger than OpenAI's Da Vinci model for GPT-3. Yeah. And um, in this train, I think, um, yeah, I think over a trillion parameter model. Oh, um, cow. and, um, and, but- and, and this one is, um, multi multitask. So what, it, and unified. So what it does is it can look at images. It can look at video. It can look at audio ingest all of that together with text Yeah, and, uh, make an, um, inference from that, um, combined set of data. So when you're describing uh, what you're describing is can Google like look at a whole page yeah. and ingest the whole experience? Yeah. I mean, it can do that with AI. It can see if the images are relevant to the content uh, mm-hmm. and so forth and so on. But but be- before we go too deep into AI, and it's kind of to dispel a little bit what you said earlier. Um, before Google started really using neural networks in, in such a way, there was Google Rank Brain. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And the way to think about it is like um, A-B testing. So at the end of the day, Google measures real users' data, real user engagement through properties it has like Google Analytics, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's, its ad network, uh, Google Chrome, mm-hmm. Android, and so forth. And it can, when it is in doubt about which two pages um, it should rank higher, just I'm just talking about from a content perspective right now. It is going to do what you would like call the Google dance and try it in different positions and then see how traffic that Google sends to those sites is behaving. Mm. Are they engaging more with that site, staying longer and so forth. And then based on that, Google also has built over the years a massive database to understand and kind of predict what kind of patterns are most likely to satisfy search intent uh, for any given keyword pattern. Mm -hmm. And so there's the, there's the um, kind of like the, you see a picture, uh, you're a young man and you're, you want to meet somebody, right? You see Mm -hmm. a picture and you're like, wow, I want to meet that person. Right. And, uh, and then after that initial impression, you still have to get to know the person a little bit. You have to date. You have to get some experience together, some shared moments uh, where you can judge it better. So that's generally how Google works. So mm-hmm. the, the the first 
pass, when it indexes sites, it kind of builds an, uh, what you could call like an initial impression of you uh, yeah. or, or your site. And then after it says, you know what, this could be something that's that's useful to this particular search intent or that particular search intent, then Google is going to then test it out with some with some rank brain experiments, right? A/B testing, mm -hmm. and that is ultimately how things get refined. So that that is not as sci-fi as what we just described, that oh. multitask united model. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but it, it it all plays together, and even if those AIs get smarter and smarter. Mm -hmm. It's still always going to Google's always still going to use user real user data to supplement that because user tastes and trends they change and so yeah. these AIs constantly need a data source of user real time feedback to see if um, if they need to be re fine tuned based on what is happening in the news or in the world right now. And so are they collecting? And this is a question I've always kind of wondered and and. Uh, you know, I don't know if they've ever even admitted to how they're, how are they collecting the user data in terms of user experience on a website? Is it primarily through the Chrome browser or are they actually looking at people's analytics data and using that to make decisions on websites? I think that, um, that they do this in a form of federated learning where, um, where they look at maybe anonymized user data mm -hmm. for a similar URL from their various properties. So from their Chrome uh, browser, Android and so forth. And um, this is what really makes Google a monopoly. Mm -hmm. It is that it's not that like Microsoft can't build a better search engine. It's that Google has more user data yeah. to constantly tweak it and, and weights parameters differently. And so, you know, I said this before, it's like the search engine that spies the most on you is going to give you the best experience. And oh, yeah. And, well, it's unfortunate. And, and, and Google, Google wins hands down. I mean, just think about Android and, you know, how many people are walking around with Google in their pocket. Um, I, I don't know. How, I don't know or see how anybody can ever close the gap on them now. Unless there's, you know, government intervention that creates some sort of environment that allows it. They're just too far right. ahead. And it's it's a data lead that nobody can capture. And this is really one of the promises of uh, advanced uh, language models mm -hmm. uh, like that, that look at all of the different media elements and, and so forth. Uh, because, you know, certain search engines like Duck.com don't spy on you as such and still provide a relatively good search experience. Now yeah. that can be augmented with these new AI models and provide an excellent search experience, uh, maybe akin to what you're used to from receiving from Google today mm -hmm. uh, in the future. But of course, by that time, Google is also going to be uh, four steps ahead. Like Google is going to be yeah. conversational search engine, right? At that time, where you're just going to talk to Google the whole concept of the top 10, it's not going to go away just like radio doesn't go away. Sure. Uh, it's still there. But majority of people are not going to be interacting with um, with information discovery in, 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 in that format. In so, uh, you know, and I've, I've, you know, been hearing about, you know, voice search for a very long time. And it, it really is a bit of a paradigm shift in how we search because right now, you type in a keyword and you're given options and you can quickly scan those options. But what does that look like when it's voice? I mean, it, are we now to the point where Google doesn't even give us options? They just tell us what's the best. What do you, I mean, where do you think that's going? Well, you know, the new Tesla S pla uh, plaid, right? Yeah. And yeah. the, the new rocket ones that are coming out. Yeah. They're, they're removing the, um, they're removing like, I don't know, the shift stick, whatever they call yeah. it to go forward or reverse. And Elon Musk is like, like, why need to, why do we need to give you that choice? We can just guess what you want to do. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to wrap your hand head around that, but okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think there's going to be, um, there's always going to be a use case for a search engine 
yeah that gives you all the options and all the digging and so forth for like researchers who really want to go and find parameters and so forth but let's be let's be real here 99% of the people just need a quick answer to a problem that has already been solved by 100 million people's sure. real time feedback so yeah um google can google can build something like this um especially with the innovations in language models is that a world we want to live in that's a whole different question well yeah i mean this is a whole philosophical conversation in terms of you know right now their algorithm already builds a profile of who you are and delivers results that they feel that you're going to be most interested in and so all of a sudden you know we have people with belief systems that have massive confirmation bias everywhere they go right. on the internet, right? Right. And by having them continue to narrow that field and continue to, to you know, narrow the options that are presented to us, I think it's just going right. to aggravate it and make things worse. And I mean, we're right. already living in this massively polarized world that is yeah. not going to get better with that, I don't think. Yeah, well... Just uh, if my kids get a hold of my phone, then for a month later, I get Minecraft videos rec <laughs> in my recommendation. <laughs> I'm just like, no, Google, that's not what I want. <laughs> not, um, not it. Yeah, try brow try uh, try using like AliExpress as a shopping app on your phone. It is like click on something one time, oh. and you know, every next scroll you're going to see that product is uh, yeah. going to be back there. It is, it is extremely irritating, but there's, um, there's a trend going on now. And I talked about authority before mm -hmm. expertise, authority, and trust. And it used to be really like you build authority with link with links. And that's where the whole page rank mm -hmm. algorithm came from. And like the patent and the origin story of Google. Um, but authority now, um, can come from from um, from other sources too, and and like one very interesting evolution that's happening is that um, writers, authors, uh, are becoming influencers for SEO. Yeah. Oh wait, SEO influencers. Yes. If somebody has a profile or reputation to write uh, about a topic and be authoritative because of their presence on the web on reputable websites, that mm -hmm. person's article is going to outrank a nobody or somebody who is not authoritative to write about a topic. And um, what, what that will do is a little bit what you just said, but also for you as an individual, like you have a podcast now about helping brands grow and, and you know, mm -hmm. ignite, right? So um, what if you ever, what if you ever said, you know, I'm kind of tired of this. I, I want to be a chef or I want to make art yeah. and I just want to do art. Right. And then you go online and Google's like, yeah, you know what? You're a nobody. You, you don't deserve to be an authority on that. Like it takes, it's going to take time and effort to build up your profile as such. And, and so uh, individuals get treated like brands in the future, uh, mm. brands themselves, it is extremely important that you protect your brand and you protect it from also bad link building and bad association and, and, and content that contains factual errors mm -hmm. or is of low quality. Uh, and, and the big question is why, why is Google doing all this? And you asked a very profound question earlier and I want to make sure your audience has a very clear understanding of why this is happening. I want you to put your yourself in the shoes of Google for a moment. Okay. These, these natural language models come around and the first thing people do is like, great. I can spin up a site with a million articles on apple cake recipes. And I'm going to let the AI write that. I'm going to outrank everybody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, spam, spam. But this one is tricky. It's good content. Yeah. It's actually written by an intelligence, albeit artificial. Mm -hmm. And at some level, it's hard to distinguish what's real and what's not real or what, well, that is a philosophical discussion of its own, but <laughs> it's, it's hard to see what was written by humans and validated and trustworthy versus what was, what is not. Yeah. And, and so what you're dealing with here 
is a bit of like a, like an economics type of situation of supply and demand. The content supply is exploding exponentially right now. But we're not having babies exponentially and we're not exploding the demand as such mm -hmm. exponentially. So now what, what Google has to figure out is how to find a needle in a haystack. Yes. And that is why Google is doing all this because you, you can, and I don't know if you, if you have like strong memories of using the internet in the, in the nineties or the early two thousands, but it was hard to find an article on what you were looking for. Sometimes totally. it, the yep. content didn't always exist. Yeah. And sometimes you had to be like, okay, I tried my best. I searched for this. It, the content's not out there. Mm -hmm. We've reached a saturation point where I can like literally come up with any idea right now, search it. And chances are 90 plus percent of the time, there's going to be an extremely detailed article by somebody who's extremely passionate and a site is extremely relevant for the broader topic. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, wow, I didn't know even this was a thing. So we've reached a saturation point between supply and demand as, 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 as such, even though there's still many search queries that were never searched for before, we, we are seeing that saturation point and we are seeing an exponential trend with content supply. And mm -hmm. so you have, you have to rely on, on authority, authority factors and quality factors to stand out. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. Today, I don't know if you were aware of this, but Ahrefs did a study. Today, 91% of content will never see search traffic. Wow. Wow. Yeah, but yeah. it makes sense because there's, I mean, at the end of the day, where does search traffic come from? It comes from page one of Google. And on page one of Google, we're, and that, that, that's getting squeezed as there's more pay-to-play spots on it. So, uh, when you really think in terms of how many websites there are and how many spots there are, yeah, it makes sense, right? Yeah. So even though the total amount of traffic that Google sends to websites is still increasing, the total percentage of search is uh, that goes to outside websites is decreasing. <laughs> so that's what we call zero click. So and that <laughs> is an evidence. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Finish what you were saying there. Yeah. And that's just evidence of Google's AI getting better at guessing for you what you might be looking for and if you think about voice search mm -hmm. well that top 10 is just top one because voice just gives you one answer mm -hmm. so okay so we've got it's always been interesting watching seo because it's always been a, a bit of a cat and mouse game who's ahead with facebook or the seo people right you know you're always trying to figure it out and game the algorithm right so now we're heading to a point where um, creating human-like, well-researched content with the click of a button is is achievable. In fact, I mean, I was I was I've been blown away by GTP three and what it's able to create already. And I mean, it's still kind of in its infancy. Over the next couple of years, that's just going to get better and better. So, as we're flooding the internet with new content, what you're saying is all pieces of content being equal, it's going to be the authority, the brand behind it that becomes more of a determining factor of who ranks. So what you're saying is, hey, people, focus on building your authority and your brand. Uh, but, but, <laughs> I, I, now here's the black hat SEO side of me guy because I've played on both sides of those fence going, okay, I'm going to build a persona and effectively leverage AI to generate the content to build that persona online. And so what's going to differentiate my brand from the other brand? And what I think it still comes back to is not what we're publishing on our own websites. It's what other websites are saying about us. And at its core, doesn't that just come back to who links to us? Yeah, but... You being invited on a trustworthy website to speak about a topic, yeah. not necessarily linking to your site, but just you, you sure. being the person that knows about this and is invited to, to, to share his or hers opinion or understandings or insights on such sites that builds authority. Yeah. But on your own site, I will say 
the qual so there's two things there's two reasons why google of the future and google today sends people to other websites if google could do it they would keep all the traffic oh, on their own yeah, home page would. <laughs> you would never leave google and you would click ads and be served ads on every single page right sure yeah so why would google ever send anybody to another site there's two reasons for it superior content or data and superior user experience mm -hmm. so that that is how you also build authority right so there is of course the ex there are the external factors uh, but there's also the quality of the content on your on your page and so I, I would say that if you want to build a long lasting value brand, mm -hmm. uh, avoid the temptation of letting AI take over your content process completely. Yeah. Make sure a human is in the loop. Yeah. Right. So this approach we're taking at our company at Inc with our technology is um, we believe in AI as a co-writing as an as, as co-writing experience, as an AI, as a writing assistant, yeah, um, that can maybe help you complete your sentence or help you complete your thought or come up with an idea for a head, your next sub headline based on competitive research. So think of it like natural language optimization, not just generation, right? Writing with insight and purpose and competitive research in mind. Uh, audience insights in mind, writing from that perspective. Mm -hmm. That is a whole new level, but always having a human in the loop. So at inkforall.com, our software, that's that's the product we have and that we are building is one that can reverse engineer what search intent is looking for, for any key phrase so that you can knock out your content out of the park and, and, and create something that will be uh, like catnip to to Google, if mm -hmm. Google were a cat, and I do think it is a cat, it, it, um, <laughs> you know, it, it changes all the time. Yeah, it only tolerates you for food, and <laughs> and, exactly, and it's right. totally unpredictable. <laughs> right, it's not like it's loyal to me or something. No, like exactly. A dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and to all you cat lovers out there, I I I completely do love cats, so this is not. <laughs> This is nothing negative. On, oh, on any cat animal. owner who loves, I love cats. I've got a cat and I'm nodding along. Like that's cats. That's part of why we <laughs> that's like cats. them. That's why, <laughs> it's part of their charm, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So um, the, the, there is the, 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 mi the micro semantics and then the macro semantics and they both build trust. Sure. So I'll give an example, right? So if your content fa f contains factual errors, Mm -hmm. then you lose trust. If it, is, if it has o over time builds a reputation for trust and, and accuracy, it builds trust. And that would be like on a mic micro level. If you speak to your audience and stick to your topic and, and focus on, on content that um, is high quality, you build authority, you build trust with Google. And on a macro level, a macro semantic level, um, it's also very important that you you stick to what you know and you're very comprehensive. So yeah. uh, pick a niche, pick a sub, a sub niche niche of, of your, of what you're going to, and, and be very specific and intentional about your, what you write. Uh, I've, I've seen it firsthand how sites can completely cannibalize or destroy their authority mm -hmm. by, um, by being authoritative about one thing and then going to that category, like right next to it and being greedy and say, I'm going to capture this too. And all of a sudden, the site doesn't rank for either. Yeah. So um, it's better to get more granular and, and expand in that sense than just go broad and try to be a site about everything. And a proof point of that, if, 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 as if I still need to prove this at this point, if, I, I believe people know this already. But uh, do you remember about.com? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. So this is like a company called Dot Dash now. And... They own many, many properties. They mm. drive, I, I, I believe, more than a billion visitors to their properties a month mm -hmm. in, in search traffic. And what they did is about.com used to be about everything mm -hmm. about, right? Yeah. And now it doesn't work anymore. So they have all these specialized 
sites, one about credit cards and one mm -hmm. about, I don't know, uh, organizing your closet and yeah. and so forth. Like, And that is what you got to do as a business too. You got to say, what am I going to be an authority about? Yeah. Then create a very strong site structure, site map that really logical and be like, and stick to your context, create a very comprehensive content strategy. That's your macro game. Semantic search engines love that. And then the individual pieces of uh, content need to be extremely optimized and high quality as well. So if you do that, then you're already building authority before you had your first backlink mm -hmm. or before, before you had your first guest post. Gotcha. And that that's 100% behind that, everything I've experienced. Well, I, I actually remember, because I go back that far too, I remember the update that wiped about out, out. Like there was like one big update that they were like overnight pfft, gone. Um, Goodbye. Fortunately, they obviously had some money in the bank to fix their problems and, and reposition. But uh, And they're doing great. It's yeah. a fantastic company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and good, good for them because I've seen a lot of companies that never recover from that, and uh, and it's very painful. Okay, so I, I've got a question for you. In turn, And this is something that I've been pondering as I've been playing around with some of the content creation tools out there using GTP3. Um, and for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about when we say GTP3 or OpenAI, OpenAI is, and you can probably give more clarity on this, but OpenAI, that's Elon Musk's company, isn't it? It used to be, and then he retreated from it. I believe there is some conflict of interest with this AI research at Tesla, probably. Okay. Um, and uh, But yeah, it was his idea to create an open source um, uh, you know, AI company. Mm -hmm. uh, his idea was uh, kind of like uh, how Texas views uh, home security. Uh, <laughs> the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So Elon Musk had the, you know, that kind of mentality towards AI. The only way to stop a bad guy with AI is having a million good guys with AI access. And therefore, if, if AI develops in the open and everybody has access to, the, to it, it will always be a counterbalance to it. Uh, mm. Even if there might be some future, you know, AI criminals out there, yeah, yeah. there will hopefully be a few <laughs> AI good people to stop it. Uh, and then eventually he retreated from it and a open AI became not so open AI after they partnered with Microsoft and uh, got a billion dollars, then chose to, um, to kind of be very, very, very cautious about how to release it in the yeah. meantime. China is creating models 10 times bigger, and I'm sure China's ethics are going to be slightly different than yeah, OpenAI's. You know, they'll and, be a little looser on the whole ethics side of it, I'm yeah. sure. Um, okay, so and, oh, and, and for everybody who's listening, uh, GTP3 is piece of open AI that's driving a lot of that. If you've seen the, and they're, they're popping up everywhere now, copywriting tools and, and uh, content generation tools, GTP3 is what's driving those. Um, and right. with your, with your platform, uh, are you guys using GTP3? Yeah. So it's, uh, GPT3 or GPT2 or GPTJ from Eleuther who did not get enough press cover coverage, but they're actually open source version of GPT3. Okay. Uh, all those are in, um, in like transformer based deep learning language mm -hmm. models that gets smarter as the, um, as the number of parameters get bigger and they're capable of inference, which means basically trying to guess what comes next. So the way that it works is you, you give it some examples mm -hmm. um, and then you give it some input on what you think you want to start your next example with. And then it, it uses artificial intelligence to auto complete that and predict what's next. And as such, um, like at inkforall.com, we've got free tools that are all using th this type of technology, mm -hmm. of course, refined and, and like, but make every website out there has like its proprietary blend and, and additional algorithms to make it better. Um, we, we have, uh, we have several of the, all of our tools are um, ac accessible for free. We give five credits a day for playing around with it. So oh, you can sweet. go to inkforall.com and play around with it. And then, um, yeah, so that that is true. The models, though, are quite expensive to run. Like the hardware is expensive to run because yeah, you have imagine, to load yeah. a lot. Yeah, the memory cost is expensive. 
And then some of the models that are, that are open source are also requiring these very fancy tensor processing units mm -hmm. uh, that are like um, 5,800 a month uh, per server or something to Ouch. run. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's for one. And then you have to scale that up. So OpenAI is going with a usage-based model. Yeah. And then there's Hugging Face that you can, for example, also pay per usage. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can just run your own server, uh, which is what we're often doing um, and bringing things in house and, and fine tuning and training it as mm -hmm. such. So, all right. So AI, and this is, this is obviously my lack of understanding of how AI works, but it's teaching itself. So is it going out and effectively just scanning what's out no, there? All not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. No. So it's not no. just digesting everything and learning. Okay. Honestly, I, and I, I'm not a program. I don't understand how it works other than the fact that I've typed stuff into it and it's come back out and spit stuff out. I'm like, I don't understand how it would have through inference even come up with that. Like mm. stuff that was too, too relevant um, or too, like, for example, I typed in a, uh, a sentence um, about, or, you know, one of my tools, you know, my tool does blah, 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 blah. And then it goes off to write a subheadline where it's actually talking about specific stuff that I'm like, did it just go scan the website? No, that's not how it works yet. So it, the, the P and the GPT is mm. pre-training, right? Pre-training. That means right. that it's not like online learning. Um, but what they did is they will take, um, like, um, I think it's from common crawl or something. They take a snapshot of the web and then mm -hmm. they heavily curate it. For example, you don't want it to be training on like a uh, racist material. Yeah, I was about stuff, to right? say, yeah, just leave, leave, right, so, leave Facebook out of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, for sure. Microsoft, if you pay notice, don't train bots on Twitter yeah. or Reddit. Okay. <laughs> It'd be an angry, um, angry thing. <laughs> Right. Uh, and God forbid anybody ever makes a, a, a Chan bot, um, <laughs> then <laughs> it'll take over the world. So, yeah. So um, now what they do is they, they take a slice of the Internet. It's about 10 percent of the Internet at the time, mm -hmm. although um, the data like exponentially is increasing right now. And then they train on that. Um, but. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different models out there. For example, Eleuther, the open source people mm -hmm. are are training on something called the pile, and you can do go download the pile, uh, and you can actually see OpenAI's limitation there, right? So I believe it like was trained in late 2019, early 2020, and they have not yet released an updated model. So if you're going to ask it to infer information that just came out or did not ex things that did not exist. Um, it will, it will like not have that knowledge available, but it can hallucinate or dream up such an information, for example. <laughs> yeah. So for example, I asked it like, w there was a movie, uh, Godzilla versus Kong, right? Yeah. Yeah. I could ask it to like, write me like a script on Godzilla versus Kong. Well, when the database was trained, that didn't exist yet, but sure. it did know Godzilla versus, uh, Mothra or something. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and it did know Superman versus Batman and it didn't know Superman and it did know Kong. So it can kind of hallucinate or imagine what, what a movie of Godzilla versus Superman might look like. And I got wow. interesting things there. Like, you know, uh, Godzilla was no match for Superman's laser eyes or something like that. And it was like, you know, great, but you, you know, there was no such movie out there that, that that doesn't exist yet. So it can hallucinate or imagine just like a human would, because the neural network is is making connections just like a human brain would make yeah. connections. Yeah. Wow. OK, so quantum computing, what is that? Okay. What is that going to do to AI if they ever figure it out? So. Is this the real thing or is this just fantasy? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, quantum computing feels like it's going to be a real thing, doesn't it? The operating system of the natural world is, is, a, is, is a quantum reality, not okay. a Newtonian physics reality, right? 
And so we have, we, you can say that the, like the, the laws of physics, like Newtonian physics and, and even like um, the constructs we learned at school and so forth, like before all this fancy stuff was discovered and now um, we question our meta reality, but it is an approximation of reality. It is not the fullness of reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the quantum quantum world is the true reality and we're just, and it doesn't quite make sense to our logical brains right now, but quantum computers have the, have the ability to run on the operating system of the quantum reality of nature, which is a whole level deeper than what, what we can comprehend mm -hmm. um, with our limited capacities. And so when you are looking at, artificial intelligence and computer simulations that deal with probabilities, uncertainty, uh, and um, natural simulations like predicting the weather or um, mm -hmm. other phenomena like the movement of water and the oceans and so forth, climate change, like real pro like that. That's where quantum computers are just going to obliterate um, classical computing. Mm -hmm. um, because they are using the language of nature and the operating system of nature to to uh, to factor in these these uh, states of probability and possibility, mm -hmm. and they can uh, they can crush supercomputers. Mm -hmm. um, and this quantum supremacy has been achieved uh, for specific type of problems that are really like based in such context, uh, where you, uh, the the world's strongest supercomputer you know, has a theoretical limit on how long it would take. It would take him like a thousand years to compute something a quantum computer can do in a few minutes Yeah, because of the type of problem. So when we're talking about AI applied to such types of problems, um, you know, you can, you can run simulations and have an AI. Well, in cases, in some cases, you can imagine that quantum AI could predict the future, maybe a few seconds before it would happen. And a very, very powerful quantum AI could maybe even go f further in the future. And all that is required is, well, we can already do that, like with the weather. Mm -hmm. We can calculate before the weather happens or before the hurricane comes, we can already predict the future. So it's already a concept that is that we're familiar with. But now imagine that same system ingesting all of the various things happening in the world and predicting the stock market or the next move of Bitcoin, right? <laughs> or Dogecoin, right? <laughs> um, God help us out there. Um, <laughs> but that is really like, that is the potential for yeah. quantum AI to really run extremely complex simulations that con conventional computing can't solve that. Uh, and then using AI to infer future possibilities, kind of like a right. box you can ask, like, should I do this? Or um, how likely is this car to hit me? And should I break in your future car? Uh, before things are happening, trying to predict what could happen. God, it's just hard to wrap your head around, hey? I mean, I'll give you one more to, to wrap your head around. Okay. Um, Google is now using AI to generate their AI chips that are running the AI. And their AI chip maker designer is outperforming human chip makers. Uh -huh. And then oh, I feel the next sorry. version of uh -huh. the hardware is then going to run a more powerful AI that will then run uh, right the next generation of chips. And so that is really where things get mind boggling. The rate of acceleration that we're going to see is um, is not something that even I can fully comprehend in the next 10 years, the rate of improvement of AI is going to be of such a nature that we cannot really comprehend it with our, with no, our we, we can't. And that's what I find fascinating. And I, I don't think uh, enough people have really gone, Oh geez, uh, particularly people in certain jobs and certain careers with certain skill sets don't realize, and this, this sounds horrible, but they're, they're a, less than a decade away from potential redundancy. Um, be being replaced. I mean, well, let's look at coding as a whole, right? Programming, developers. 
how long before AI is able just to write the code? We give it the outcome we're looking for, and it's going to figure out the most efficient way to create the code to to build that. I mean, if you're saying right. AI is already being designed by AI, the chips, why not the code? Right. So the question is, how long can we get AI to work for us? Right. <laughs> not against because- us. <laughs> It's like in the in the movie Planet of the Apes. If you cage a few yeah. monkeys, that all of a sudden get smarter than humans. Yeah, it doesn't end well, right? And how long can you keep those monkeys uh, caged until they figure a way out? Yeah. And uh, once the AI gets smarter than us, um, now obviously we love our cats and we love our dogs, and we we think it's not ethical for them to hurt and so forth. Like. You know, maybe we would be like cutesy to such a scenario to the AI, right? And let's let's not harm our, our fellow intelligence here, right? Even though we're smarter. But that's really the key. Like, can we can AI be in service of humankind or um, is it going to pursue its own uh, objectives and goals? And um, that's what Elon Musk would call like, are we just a biological bootloader for the... You know, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, who knew Terminator had it, you know, (laughs) they weren't far off, right? When they made those. But Uh, here's something optimistic that I really uh, am excited about. Okay. Yep. So with, with, with unlimited advancement and exponential advancement in computational power and, and intelligence of of, of, um, computing, we could solve problems that, uh, we would take us a thousand years to figure out maybe we can cure cancer. Maybe yeah. we can, we can, we can solve hunger and, and figure out a way to solve climate change and still have enough energy to uh, warm ourselves or cool ourselves in, 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 uh, in different weather scenarios. Maybe we come up with ways, maybe simulations for Mars and making it habitable. Mm-hmm. And maybe uh, our job is to just be gardeners of the universe and turn everything into beautiful gardens all over the, the universe. And, and what would otherwise take us maybe uh, a million years to figure out in a conventional way, maybe can be dramatically accelerated. We are a species that we are not faster than a cheetah, but we mm. can make a car that is faster than any animal or we can we're not fat we can't fly but we can make devices that make us fly sure. and yeah. we can even use a bicycle and go faster than cheat us over a period of time yeah so humans always have augmented our ability with uh, with tools and it is really what has made us who we are as a as as a species is ability to interact with our environment and augment our capabilities. And, and this is just the next step of that. Maybe we live in a Star Trek like future where we don't have to work, but we can all be artists and mm-hmm. uh, pursue our interests and passions and just be human and compassionate. And for everything um, that AI is able to do, will it have a soul? Will it bleed? Will it have empathy? Or will it just um, process what empathy looks like and love looks like? Um, so I think there's always going to be a room for humans and mm-hmm. human nature because um, intelligence is not all there is. I know some horrible human beings that are very smart and I know yes, some yes. wonderful human beings that are not mm-hmm. uh, as high IQ. Mm-hmm. And so the value of a human is not defined by our in- intellect alone. And so likewise, the value of AI, even if it gets very intellect without a soul can never be more valuable than that of a, a human with a good heart. But it's interesting because we live in a time and place where we're currently placing uh, massive value on intelligence. You know, I mean, when you look at the wealthiest people in the world, they're all very, very high intelligence, almost some cases on a spectrum somewhere, um, you know, doing doing amazing things. And, and, you know, it's interesting. I hope, I hope, and I, I'm, I'm typically an optimist, but I'm hoping that, that we choose the path that leads to a place where we can all prosper without destroying what we've, what we've created. Right. right? Um, and, and honestly, I feel, I feel like it's a race, whoever right. gets there first, because let's talk 
you know, quantum computing, if it gets into the hands of, let's say, North Korea, who can't make a nuclear weapon, so I'm not particularly concerned about them in quantum computing, but let's say North Korea beat everybody to quantum computing, they would be able to walk through every piece of security that exists. Nothing would be safe. So, you know, I feel like we're in this sort of this, this race to get there first so that it is controlled by the right people. Yeah. So the, the question is to like, are we going to destroy ourselves before we reach enlightenment? Right. Yes. So, yes. Right. Yes. And yeah. So very smart people and um, physicists and philosophers have talked about this topic at length. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, maybe nobody more than Elon Musk right right now who's like saying we have to become a multiplanetary yes uh, yeah. civilization before we destroy ourselves like it's almost like a given that eventually it will will mess things up it's just a matter of time we came we came close to really really messing things up with like the the cold war and mm -hmm. the nuclear bombs but there's no more nuclear bombs now than there were in the, like the 60s and 70s. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and they've got more advanced and more powerful since then. Mm -hmm. I'm really hoping we can uh, we can unlock uh, fusion energy in the next five years, mm -hmm. um, and then um, and then get use the AI to come up with like a sustainable battery breakthrough that would not tax Earth's resources or be toxic and as sure. such. And then I want to the government to pass a law to make Amazon AWS the cloud to go like on the dark side of the moon or something. They get free cooling for their servers. Oh, but maybe yeah, we can, there you go. Maybe we can keep the earth uh, beautiful as like a reservation, yeah, yeah. As, as a beautiful uh, park that yeah. is like um, like a real park that has like a, that that is not to be destroyed. And mm -hmm. then, if we want to mess up uh, Mars or something, like let's test our atomic bombs and stuff there. Let's sure. keep yeah, this planet exactly. beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. Okay, I mean that's so funny. You know, I started this podcast thinking we're going to talk about SEO and AI, and this has been absolutely one of the best conversations I've had because this is it's just fascinating. I love your insight. That said, before we wrap up. Tell me about the ink editor. Who is it for? What can people use it for? Who should be using it? Yeah. Uh, well, whether you're an uh, whether you're an SEO expert or not, or know nothing at all about it, if you're going to write on the web, you you got to rise above the noise. Mm -hmm. And essentially, ink, you know, or it's patented, and you can all read about how it works. But it will it will reverse engineer what Google's looking for for content for any key phrase. And if you follow the easy steps and advice and your score will be higher, you know, in real time, how well you're doing, then you're 450% more likely to be on the first page of Google. So if you're writing for the web, you should really use ink. And then uh, where else ink is going is it's also in addition to being your best friend it's a software like Word, you know, it's a writing software for your desktop. Uh, it's really fun to write in. But in addition to all that smart that's built in, um, that's really designed to empower you, right? It's We're also starting to um, augment it with, with AI, natural language generation and optimization so that you can... Uh, eliminate writer's block and you can get your content optimized faster and written faster. Uh, so there's very exciting things there. So anybody who gets like a, a membership with Inc gets the editor and gets all of the short form content writing AI tools included with their membership as well. And then, um, and then the next generation of Inc will then also help you write SEO optimized copy, product copy, um, conversion copy, like with less effort than it ever took. Imagine walking um, from one side of the U.S. to the other versus flying. That's yeah. how big this feels. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm going to be signing up for this like literally when we're done and and diving into it because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've used a few of the tools and just playing with it. 
that's where people have got to realize it. It it's a it's like a it's a shortcut. It's not it's not it's not going to write everything for you, but it can make writing things so much easier. And I think it's your bicycle. It's it, your bicycle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I just it wanna... makes it makes transportation fun. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yes. And it takes. I, I love the fact it takes away the writer's block, right? And it gives you ideas on way to on, on stuff that you're not going to come up with on your own. But you know, going back yeah. to what you talked about before, I just want to set everybody's expectation because I know people are always like, oh, "I just want to push a button and everything's going to happen." I don't think that's the right way to approach it. And I like oh. what you were saying is, no, that's not how you approach it. You use it to augment what you're doing and support you along yeah. the way, which is fantastic. There needs to be a human in the loop. And yeah. it's very important. Um, uh, there's a po- uh, there's a poem uh, out there. Um, I don't know the author. I'm sorry if you're alive. <laughs> uh, I want to give you credit. So for sure, if you like this, go look up the author. But it was, um, I believe, it was something like "Baby Shoes Never Worn." What was it? Yeah. And, and think about how much emotion a human. Oh my god! Oh my is in, god! That's that. so yeah. Yeah, how can an AI like convey that? Yeah. Right. So you need you need a human uh, to y- yes use your bicycle, but involve a human. Like yeah. you you get to have the fun. You get to enjoy the writing. You get to get the ROI benefit. Sure. You get to get found, engage, and convert. And look, we're at Inc. We're we're a startup like everybody else. We're working super hard. We've got our engineers and AI researchers and which I'm working on with the innovation department every day. We're working tirelessly to bring all of that complex stuff and 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 put it in tools that can be used for good. Yeah. Right. And so we're a partner in that. It's an exciting journey. Like what we can do today is going to, um, uh, you know, is 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 only a fraction of what's going to be possible in the next few years. But we want to be a partner with people that want to follow us along in our journey. Also, we have. Our, our product, our free tier is also amazing, just mm-hmm. in and of itself. So if you write content online, there's no reason not to use Inc. And yes, our pro plans add several amazing benefits, but even our free product out there is better than some and many paid products. Uh, and it's better than anything you've ever used in the past for your web content writing. Fantastic. Well, um, you know, when we started this, I said, ah, about 35 to 45 minutes, but honestly, it's just been uh, just such a fascinating conversation. I could talk for hours more and we didn't even really go deep into SEO. I could have got a lot further. there. We're gonna have to do this again sometime. Um, uh, that was awesome. So uh, uh, Alexander, thank you so much for being here and, uh, sharing your insights and wisdom. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And if you ever want to have me back, feel free to send me a message. Uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll reappear. If uh, new GPTs come out or something, and you want to have the Done. inside story, Done. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it. Love it. Okay, you're my new my new source for all of this. So fantastic! And See? I just I just became an authority. You See? did <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me anytime, anytime. And for all the listeners out there, uh, of course, any links will be included in the show notes, but, uh, Alexander's website, just in case you missed it, is ink for all.com ink I N K F O R A L L.com. And, uh, guys, you know what? go check it out. Um, If you're somebody who just struggles with producing content, you want to uh, uh, level up your content. Um, But more specifically, you want to start producing content that Google is going to love and is going to give you a leg up on competition. You got to go check it out. So as always, if you liked what you heard today, please leave a rating, leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. That is a fuel that keeps me going, making these podcasts for you. And on that note, this episode's a wrap. We'll see you again real soon. Thanks for listening to another info-packed episode of the Project Ignite podcast with Derek Gale. Any links mentioned along with an entire transcript of this episode can be found at projectignite.com slash podcast. And to make sure you never miss another episode, go to iTunes or SoundCloud now and subscribe.